Welcome to the house of the Lord tonight. Let's get ready to worship the Lord. Praise God. He's been... I don't like it. Lord has been good and faithful. Let's get ready to worship him. Lord, we just thank you tonight for your presence. We thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you, Lord, for how you are faithful in all your ways. Lord, as we're about to worship you, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill this house with your presence. Lord, minister to us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit tonight. Be here, Lord, and be magnified in all that is said is done. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would just lift up, speak through your Holy Spirit, speak through your word, Lord. Minister by your Spirit, in your power, your might, in your precious, precious sweetness, Lord. We'll give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah.
praise you and we worship your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, glory to your name. Hallelujah, we worship your holy name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah.
you just sing one more song with me tonight? Sing it to him from your heart tonight. His presence is so powerful in this place. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord Jesus.
Hallelujah. 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 We worship your name, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, precious Holy Spirit. You are worthy. We glorify your name in all the earth, Lord. We praise you. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. Lord, I thank you tonight for your presence. I thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, that you have come. That your presence here is, Lord, to minister to heal, Lord, to powerfully move upon our lives. Lord, I thank you. Hallelujah. You're so worthy of all praise, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you inhabit the praises of your people as we worship you, as we glorify your name. We stand in awe of your presence in all of all that you do, in the majesty of your manifest glory. Lord, for we have come into this house to worship you. We have come into this house to seek your face.
We've come into this house, Lord, that you might pour into us through your word, through your Holy Spirit, Lord. In all manner, Lord, that you might be glorified in our lives in every aspect, Lord. In our comings, in our goings, in our sayings, in our doings. We worship you. There is none like you, Lord. There is no one, Lord, that could ever take your place. Your peace that passes all understanding. Your power that sets the captive free. That mends broken hearts, broken bodies. Lord, we come against every sickness and infirmity tonight. In the name of Jesus, Lord, the power of your Holy Spirit, the power of your hand, the touch, the healing touch of the Master. Lord, I pray that you would break every stronghold. I pray that you would heal every infirmity. Lord, relieve symptoms. Make new, Lord. We energize, encourage, strengthen, Lord. Lord, I pray for that peace that passes all understanding. Lord, I pray for those that are down, that, Lord, you might lift them up. You might encourage them. Lord, I pray for those, Lord, that might be anxious and uncertain about a future, Lord, about something going on in their life. I pray, Lord, that you would give them that rest assurance. Lord, that you would give them that peace that passes all understanding. That peace that you said you give, not as the world can give, but Lord, you give a peace that is greater. Lord, I thank you and praise you. You are so awesome in this place. How we love to worship you. How we love to sing praises and magnify your name. Oh, that your presence might come about and your glory might be present. Your manifest glory might fill the house as it has tonight and over and over again that we never take it for granted. That we never take it as, Lord, just something that always happens. But, Lord, to know that you are faithful in all your ways. And that when your people gather together all in one accord and they come together, Lord, focused on you and to sing praises to you, to glorify your name, to seek your face. You are faithful to come. You are faithful to minister. You are faithful to speak, Lord. You are faithful to come and to have your way in our lives. Change us to be more like you, Lord. Change us, Lord, to trust you more and better. Change us, Lord, that we might be stronger soldiers of the King. Lord, stronger in battle. Lord, I thank you tonight. I thank you and praise you. We thank you, Lord, and praise you. How we love to magnify your name. You're worthy. Now be glorified. Even in the rest of this service, I pray. In Jesus' name, and all in the house said, Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Wow. Give him his praise. His praise. Give him his praise. I can feel Lord. His majesty. Yes. 
You can never stop a worship leader slash pastor from singing. Making melody in my heart, and it just comes out. Hmm. Praise the Lord. Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. Glory. Well, tonight I have prepared a message for us calling preparing for, or, yeah, preparing for God's presence. Wouldn't you, isn't that something? Preparing for God's presence. Well, I, I knew that I was speaking on that, so I had a little in on getting the songs ready for tonight. But you know, we have really enjoyed the presence of God here and what he's been doing. Last Thursday was just unbelievable. The glory of God settled so strongly that we didn't have a human word message. Even though, I, 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 I should rephrase that, we didn't have something that was prepared because the Holy Spirit had something else for us. And I have to tell you, it was truly amazing God never ceases to amaze me through his Holy Spirit because he just continues to uh, do something different sometimes, and sometimes he just raises the level and raises the bar. And the reason I really felt impressed to the Lord is for us to even go a little bit deeper. You're like, wow, he, how much more can we get from him, right? He's got so much more. He has so much more. And um, I always say, though, you know, the presence of God isn't just for the house of the Lord. It isn't just so that we, you know, it's awesome to be in his presence. And, and you don't want to leave it. But it, it doesn't mean when we leave here that we can't take it with us. It might not always feel the same, but he's with us. And when we encounter things as we go through our life, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to, be, is to strengthen us and encourage us. So I'm going to read from Acts chapter 2, but before I get there, guys at uh, Ruggiero's at 6.30, ladies are meeting here, I'm sorry, at 6, at 6, and the ladies are meeting here downstairs. Um, so um, I just, just wanted to remind you of that. And uh, Sunday, uh, don't forget we're on Philadelphia number 6, and we're going to talk about the last, I'm actually going to finish the last two verses, the last verse or two verses of um, Revelation chapter 3, 12, I think, and 13. And uh, I, I'm really excited about what the Lord is speaking when we've studied this. I, as I've said, I never intended this to be a series. We're at six weeks on Philadelphia, and we've been through all of the other churches, and we have Laodicea left, to, so the Lord knows how long that will take. But it's been enlightening, and the Lord has challenged me. The Lord has spoken to me, and, and I've been excited about what God's speaking. And who knows what after that's done, we may be in the book of Revelation to continue because it's so relevant for what we're seeing today. And it should be, as what, what did he say to the Phil Philadelphia? He said, I know your works. I'm coming quickly. I'm coming quickly. It's a warning for those that aren't ready and it's a cur an encouragement for those that are ready that are enduring. Endure to the end, and we will be saved. So Acts chapter 2, that's another message for another day. That's Sunday. So uh, do you don't want to miss it, not because I'm preaching, but maybe half because I'm preaching, but the other half is because the Holy Spirit's empowering me. And without him, I couldn't do any of it. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the ho whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you tonight for this is the word of the Lord. And Lord, I thank you that you speak through your word, you speak through song, you speak into our hearts, into our minds. Lord, as I'm about to deliver this message, Lord, I pray that you would help me to deliver it with clarity, that it would be your words and not mine. We came to hear what you have to say, 
I don't, and we all, none of us really care what I have to say personally, Lord, but I really, really care what you want us to hear today. So, Lord, please anoint me. Please give me the words that you have for us tonight and hide me behind your cross, and I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. This is an incredible backdrop, and you all, I always tell you, let's, I want us to really make things applicable to our life, and, and so if um, we can place ourselves back in Acts chapter 2, if we can imagine, because you know what? It, it really applies to us today, too, and let's think about that as we go through this. In Acts chapter 1, we see that there is an expectation. In Acts 1 verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for truly John baptized with water, but here is, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You have to wonder, did they really know what being baptized with the Holy Spirit would really mean? How would this happen? How would this even come about? You know, when God promises us something, I wonder if they were like us. We start to formulate all ideas how it's going to happen. We start thinking about, God said he's going to do this for me, so that must mean this. And then when he does it, you're like, oh, what, what do you mean, God? I thought you meant this. And we're like, and he says, I didn't mean that. You took it on your own, and you made your own story out of it. So you wonder what they were thinking. He said, go wait in Jerusalem. Go wait there and have an expectation. You hear me every Sunday. I hope you came here expecting, expecting to receive from the Lord. I come here expecting. You know, I used to be like when I first started pastoring, and um, that's a, you know, a thing that happens sometimes. The Lord was so powerful and things were moving so quickly. And, and I'll, I always tell you, I share with you, that I was so concerned about pastoring that I lost sight of asking the Lord for his gifts and to empower me to really take us to another level as a church. And what I saw take place, though, he did it anyways without even me asking. And we saw the prophetic. We saw the Holy Spirit doing things in an amazing way. And he still is. It's just not the same way. He's doing things a little bit differently. But what expectation? See, our expectation has to be not that we have formulated an expectation, but that we have said, Lord, okay, I'm expecting something. I, so you know what I've learned to do? Say, Lord, whatever you're going to do. I'll, and you know, I used to get myself like, oh, what's he going to do? Um, okay, if we do this and if we do, I, I, and I never tried to formulate. I, I'm not trying to say that I tried to, to put God in a box and say, okay, God, you got to do this or that. That doesn't work out too well when we do that. But I learned this, that if I will just let him and come here and not set my agenda or, oh, last week was really great, there's a temptation to say, wow, that was awesome. Lord, do that again. And, and you know what his answer to that is? Well, yeah, that was good for last week, but I got something else for you for this week. And it might not seem to you like it's as exciting, but it's, it's meaningful to us from him. You know, a father doesn't give um, a child shouldn't cake and pie all the time for dinner. You got to have some meat and you got to have some carbohydrates and potatoes. Jesus knows us and humans better than we know ourselves and he prepares us to have an expectation because he wants believers to be expecting. He says to them, you shall you shall. And I thought of this. We should enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise with expectation. With expectation. Oh, I'm just going to church today. I wonder, you know, how goofy pastor can be. I wonder what songs he can mess up or maybe he won't lock his microphone and it won't work for three quarters of the service on a Sunday when you got visitors. Well, praise the Lord, you know. An expectation of what he might do. You never know. He's amazing. He'll, 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 he'll just blow your mind. Expected. These, aren't, these are just like introduction points. 
There was obedience in Acts chapter 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. When they, and then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Ot called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Their expectation led them to be obedient. They waited. He said, go wait there. The King James says, tarry. He said, go wait in Jerusalem for the Father's gift. That he's good. They had no idea. They had no idea what they were. I mean, there had been, uh, previously there had been uh, times that the Holy Spirit acted in the Scripture. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They had no idea. If they did, they wouldn't have locked all the doors maybe. Because they wouldn't have thought of, you know, the Holy Spirit coming in with uh, everything locked up. And they, they probably would have, you know, because they might have messed it up, you know, if they really thought. But maybe they did. Who knows what they thought? I'm not sure. And I'm not a theologian. Maybe somebody does know what they thought. Or somebody thinks they know what they thought. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that think they know what they thought. They had no idea what it would be like, but they obeyed. And God said, I got something for you. Just go wait there. Waiting is the worst thing for people. Waiting is the worst thing for us. Be patient. Patient endurance. Suffer persecution, opposition. Thirdly, there was a warning. He said uh, in, X, in verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put his, in his own authority. What were they more worried about? They were worried about the political system of the day. Are you going to restore the kingdom now on earth? And he's like, oh my goodness, will you ever get it? It's not up to you to, for the restoration of the kingdom. It's not up to you to worry about that stuff. Just go and get there and, and wait for me, to, to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Wait for the gift to come. See, okay, they did. I'm sorry, I'll answer my own que question. They had an expectation. They thought he was, oh, here, you're leaving? And what are you going to do? What are we going to do now? Well, who's going to set up this kingdom on earth? You're leaving now. And he said, it's not up to you to worry about that. That's a message to us. It's not up to you to worry about that. You know, um, uh, we can, uh, it, it just keeps growing and growing. I could say this every week because there is no shortage of chaos on the TV. There is no shortage of chaos in the news. And, and um, I could tell you this every day and every week. But remember, I always, I, look, I'm not a pastor that says, uh, what was it, the shepherding movement, whatever the pastor says you do, but I'm not that kind of pastor. But I'm telling you that you need to like, Control how much of that diet you get of that stuff because it's all not everything that you hear is true and not everything that you see is true on TV. They distort it for their own means. Some of it might be pieces like my micro pieces of it, but we don't know. That's why that's why the Lord is is trying so hard for His people to get His people to say, "Trust me, you gotta trust me." you got to trust me. Think about this now. We're in Acts. Think about the day. Think about what's happening. And Jesus was not accepted by everyone. Yet there were thousands saved in the new church. But Jesus wasn't accepted. There was unity. In verse 14, they all continued with one accord. People make a joke, you know, playing the guitar. They all played the same note. They were all in the same chord. No, it means they were all in agreement. Did that mean that they all agreed on everything? No, it meant that they were there focused on a, on a purpose. You know, there's a reason. There's a diversity of opinions. There's a diversity of people. And why is there a diversity? Why do they make a board of people to make decisions for diversity, not for argument, not for um, contention, 
but because a diversity of people brings a diversity of ideas. The focus is the same. And when the focus and the motive is truly the same, you come out with a good end. You come out with a good conclusion and a good resolution. But when motives are off, like one of the churches we studied not too long ago, in the seven, when their works were, were in error because they were more worried about building the church here than they were building the kingdom, they were more worried. They had a great church. They had all these things and all these programs. But it wasn't really ministering the gospel to people, and it really wasn't ministering what the Lord had intended for them. But a unity of focus. And that's, you know, that's one of the things. I, um, you know, I don't, I'm not saying there's disunity, but if we all say, you know what, Sunday morning or Thursday night, we're coming here and, and we're all expecting the Lord to do something magnificent. We're going to leave it open to him to do what he sees fit. And we're going to just let him do it, but we're going to all be focused on the same thing. Lord, you just need to come down here today and you just need to speak to us in whatever manner and fashion you do. Last week he spoke through the songs. He literally spoke his message to us through the songs that we were singing. And he does that so often. I tell you, the words to a song are not just words to a song to sing. There's power in those words when we, when we sing them from our heart, when we sing them to the Lord with all that we have. There was prayer. Verse 14, they continued one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. There were all of those things in expectation, and all of those things took place, and it was all together. And then there was a sound of, uh, uh, two observations, there was a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind. It was like the announcement, attention please. I used to remember in school, you would look out the window and you see the snow drifting outside from the lunchroom. And when you heard the PA system, and um, you could, back then it was usually the principal or the superintendent, and when you heard their voice, you were like, ah, we're going home early. Attention, please. May I have your attention, please. And... Uh, that bass voice of Mr. Berbrick. And we knew that that was going to be, we're going home. Yes, and we're all cheering. Little did we know the port bus drivers that had to go through that and get us all. Well, I didn't, back then not everybody rode the bus. So we either found a ride home or we walked half a mile through the snow and through, uh, the, you know, all of the <laughs> snow drifts. There was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And God wanted to get their attention, gather them together. I can imagine that would be a, a, an attention getter if there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And then there was a fire from heaven. A symbol of the fire came down and revealing that God wants to anoint everyone to be more effective witnesses in every aspect of our lives. The fire of heaven came down. Wow, can you imagine? But here's what, here's what I, I want us to get tonight from this. Because sometimes, you know, we can get discouraged. God's presence comes in times of uncertainty and adversity. In times of uncertainty and adversity. There were three Jewish festivals each year for every male Jew to attend. Every male Jew within 20 miles of Jerusalem attend, must attend. There was the Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of the Tabernacles. And the word Pentecost means 50th because it fell on the 50th day after the Passover. Think about this. this there was an international crowd. There would be the biggest crowd of all the festivals on Pentecost. Hmm. Just so happens. You know, wink, wink, right? Just so happens the biggest crowd had gathered together for this festival it was the uh, occasion that God would choose to pour out his spirit on believers. And the Lord had just, uh, think about this for a minute now, too. The Lord had just ascended 
and the disciples were all alone. And remember when they asked him about, well, is this the restoration of the kingdom? And he said, shh, shh, this is not for you to have to worry about. Don't worry about that. Let me worry about that. You just go do what I tell you to do. And their hopes were shattered. Think about this too. Rome was breathing threats because of the, mes the, the message of the gospel and the resurrection was being preached and there, there was opposition. And Peter, remember Peter said, I don't even know what to do. I'm just going to go back to fishing for a while. Well, if I was uptight, I can tell you I probably wouldn't go fishing because I never caught anything, but that's just me. So if people caught fish, you know, well, Peter, what, you know, Jesus came. He, he gave him a boatload of fish. Think about this, and think about today, and we say, you know, Lord, have mercy. And, and, and you know, I'm not one of those, uh, but think about the situations of the world today and what an opportunity, oh, here we, a window of opportunity like Philadelphia for the Lord's power to be released in the world. Lord, why aren't you doing something about everything going on? And his answer to us is, I am. Just read my word. It's all going to happen. And we talked about it last or two weeks ago. If we'll stay true to him and keep his word, if we'll endure it, he's going to take us out. And, and I preached to you and I gave you a whole sermon on why um, I'm pre-trib and why the first assembly, we're pre-trib, why the assemblies of God is pre-trib. It's not to make an argument, it's to give us a hope. Where's our hope? Where's our deliverance if, if we are believed? But look at the opportunity with uncertainty there was opposition to the gospel. The opposition keeps growing in the United States, doesn't it? Well, Christians aren't loving people. Christians hate these people. Hate, no, that, no. And see, they try to formulate. and try. It's the same stuff. They said the same thing. Oh, Jesus, you're of the devil. How did you heal that person? Look at the poor guy. He gets healed, and they're like, oh, how did it happen? He went... They went to his parents. How did your kid get healed? And he's, they're like, I don't know. Ask him. And he's like, I don't know how he did it, and I don't really care. I was blind. Now I can see. What does it matter? If I were him, he probably said to them, if you were blind, you wouldn't care how they did it either. Think of the opposition. And look at today. Now, we already have the Holy Spirit, but what I'm saying is if we have an expectation for what he can do, we can look at him bringing, uh, let's go to the next level. Let's go to another level in the Holy Spirit. Does that mean it's, it's bigger, faster, and stronger? It doesn't necessarily mean that. It means, see, remember, what is the Holy Spirit really in our life for to guide us into all truth, to comfort us? And it's wonderful when he pours out his Spirit here on a Sunday or a Thursday, and people are touched, and you know, people get healed, people get slain, people get uh, speak, you know, they speak in tongues, and they and and all the manifestations are wonderful. But if it doesn't change when we walk out the door, then it was all for naught. It's more than the the goosebumps and the jumping and and the quiet and all of that. It's about changing our lives. <laughs> And really, the Lord is saying, and you know, that whole, my whole series on Sunday is living according to God's word because, I don't know what sermon it was, but it's like a room closing in. And this is the world today. And it, we're, as believers, the, rooms are, the room is closing in on us. But you know what's happening? The power of God can get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's what he's trying to do for his believers in the last days. Remember, the Bible calls it savage times, if you interpret the Greek. Savage, hard-to-take times. Are we in that? I don't think we need to ask ourselves that. Every time I drive by the gas pumps. I said to my wife the other night, 
I hope they don't see this because they'll start raising them. You know, every time something is happening in the Middle East, oh, we got to raise the gas, you know. Oil's got to shoot through the roof. It's down 10 cents a gallon. What? And, and there's turmoil in the Middle East like there's never been, right? Watch Israel. This is all, this is all, uh, it, it, you know what blows my mind? I just read and heard a preacher a few weeks ago how Israel will be the bone and contention of nations. Always has, but it, it's really ramped up. Eschatology. Israel is in the focus and the circle, and everything is going around it. Watch Israel, read the Bible, and it'll tell you all that we need to know and more that we really might not want to know. And why it's important to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. There's, he comes, and his presence is powerful in times of uncertainty. Nobody knew exactly what to expect when the promise of the Spirit would be fulfilled. And as we put that in, in perspective today, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but as the song says, we know who holds tomorrow. And how do we get through tomorrow? We listen to what the Spirit has to say. How do we understand what God's trying to do? How do we understand what he wants us to do? We listen to what the Spirit has to say. That voice that says to you, eh, yeah, that's not a good idea. That voice that says, Maybe you ought to do this, or maybe you ought to not do that. And if we listen to that voice, and we apply it to the Word of God, because that voice, what is the Bible says, he only speaks what he hears in heaven. So he's not going to tell us to do something anti-scriptural. Listen to what the Spirit says. How could God pour out his Holy Spirit in a uncertainty and adversity? Well, that's exactly how he operates. That's how God operates. Because he knows we need more energy for the fight and for the battle. And he will raise the level. He does work in uncertain and adverse times. Secondly, there was a presence of hunger. And those, uh, the, God's presence comes when those who are hungry. What does it mean to be hungry? And it's not like Sunday and it's almost noon and I'm talking about this. So, um, and, and it's not a dinner day where you're actually smelling the food downstairs. So if you haven't eaten supper, I'm sorry if you're hungry. It means to desire something more and more. Oh, I'm hungry. I want to eat. The hunger is derived, and, and this hunger is a desire for more of God. And it's derived from humility, recognizing the need of his presence and the insufficiency of ourselves. If nothing else in this world today, in adversity, opposition, persecution, and uncertainty, if there's nothing else we under, need to understand as believers is that we ho don't have what it takes in of ourselves to make it to the end, to finish the race having kept the faith. We cannot do it. Sorry if I burst your bubble today. You can't do it. I can't do it on my own. We need the power of God as through the Holy Spirit in our lives to teach us, to empower us, to comfort us, to speak to us, to direct us, to correct us, to keep us on the straight and narrow. God's presence comes to ordinary common people that are hungry for him. I love this. Abraham Lincoln said, God must love ordinary people because he made so many of them. He made so many ordinary people. Pentecostal believers, we must guard that we, we do not lose our hunger, which affects our expectation, which is affected by our humility. See, when we're humble and we understand that it's not about us and that we can't do it on our own, when we understand that we're insufficient in and of ourselves, see, that's not the world's view, though. If you just sit and hum, you, you can do it. You know, you reach inside yourself. If we're reaching inside ourselves, we need to be grabbing a hold of the Holy Ghost inside. If we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, he resides in us. We need the power of God working in our lives. And then we understand, I can't do this on my own. And you know, sometimes we get to that only in desperation, but we shouldn't get to that point. We should live constantly saying, Lord, we can't do this on our own. 
if we could, it wouldn't be God's, I mean, what would we need God for then, right? And he doesn't want that. He wants us to do, an ex- he wants us to, to have exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could think or ask. He wants to work in our lives beyond what our comprehension is. And if you were to look back at some of the things that God has done in your life, in spite of adversity, trial, struggle, uh, physical affliction, infirmities, in spite of all of that, if you look back at what God has done, you'd be like, wow, I never would have thought that. Hmm. And sometimes, sometimes uh, the Lord will just show you. You know, I, I, there's things that uh, I never ex- uh, thought of them in, a different, in certain ways and things that God has done and given me the ability, the favor, the power to do. And I look back or someone may say to me, do you realize this, this, and this, and all that you've done, this, that, and that? And I'm like, oh, wow, yeah, I guess so, or whatever. Because we don't, we hopefully, if we're at humble, we're not thinking about, oh, I'm walking around, I'm really somebody. You know, I'm really a somebody, I'm really a somebody. God has a way of dealing with that, too. That's not good, either. God desires people to have a childlike dependency on him. I always love this, uh, what Moses said in Exodus 33, 14. He told the Lord, he said, my, or God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses' response was, then he said to him, if your presence not, does not go with us, don't bring us up from here. Lord, if you're not going to be with me, I always say this Sunday, if you're not coming, Lord, then we don't need to be here either. I could stand up here and regurgitate Bible to you, but unless the Holy Spirit's going to come and and, and do his work, it all will sound good, but maybe it won't sound good either. I don't know, but if he's not coming, there's no sense of being here. And, And that's what I've heard some, you know, Churches where the Lord is, there's no time for him. Well, we, we can't do that. You know, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. I was speaking to uh, one of the, the uh, gentlemen that was here, a missionary uh, to uh, youth and teen in, um, in New York. And he, was, he attends a church in Syracuse. It's a large church. But the gifts of the Spirit are in, in operation. And uh, it's... Even though it's a large church, they're still allowing, and that's exciting to know that God's people are doing that, because we need that. We really need that. God fills believers that are hungry. He draws near to the desperate. God's presence comes to those who are hungry and humble. And when God's presence fills the church, it fills the people, and it spills out of the church, and it goes into the community. And it, it, goes for, it goes outside, not us four and no more. It goes, see, what happens here is supposed to spill out out there. We take it with us. Take the name of the Lord with us. Take the name of Jesus with us. Shout Jesus in the mountains. <laughs> Shout Jesus in the streets. Oh, you know, I cannot get that song out of my head. I can't help it, so I'm, I'm sorry it's been, what, two or three weeks in a row, but it is so powerful. Shout Jesus for your family. Shout Jesus for the captive. Shout Jesus. <laughs> you know, my grandmother, when she used to get prayed for, she just would, you know, she spoke broken English, and, and uh, evangelists would say, I get blessed just praying for her. And she would, with her broken English, she would shout Jesus. She, Jesus, 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 Jesus. She'd just shout his name. And I know uh, Heidi's mom would, would, would uh, she would talk about times like if they were driving and the car was snowy and, and the, she was sliding like they were going to go off the road. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. She'd start calling on his name. It's not in vain. Take the, call on the name of the Lord. Shout Jesus. I don't know, praise the Lord. That's. Hunger, Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. If we hunger and we thirst for it, he'll fill us. He'll fill us. Thirdly, God's presence uh, comes to overcome our weaknesses. Uh, Acts 2, 3 and 4, 
Then there appeared to them uh, divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Isn't it interesting that he chose to come and, and, and touch the tongues of people? And that was the evidence of, of the, the Holy Spirit. That was the evidence of the Holy Spirit that they spoke in other tongues, that he touched the tongue. Well, why is that? What does the Bible tell us about the tongue? Death and life, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. James 3, 8, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Why? Because in our humanity, we, are one, we can be one thing and then we can be the other. And how many times have we not known what to said? And maybe how many times have we said what we shouldn't have? Or how many times have we not said what we shouldn't have? Does that make sense? He overcomes our weaknesses. And, they, and the first thing, that, and, and the cloven tongues of fire on their tongue. But it's not just the tongue. Think of all our, our think of our, um, maybe we're shy. Maybe we have fear. Maybe we have physical restrictions. Maybe emotionally we're not strong in areas. And the Holy Spirit gets us to do things that we wouldn't be able to do because he overshadows the things in our lives that hold us back. He, he gives us the strength to overcome that. I share with you a lot that people, you know, since pastoring, and um, uh, I'll, if I speak prophetically to somebody, I don't always remember, and then somebody might ask me a question, and, um, and they might say, what did you say? Or they might say, what did you mean by that? And then sometimes people will come and they will say, they will ask to talk to me, and then they will ask me something, and I'm like inside going, any time now, Holy Spirit? Okay, I'm waiting for the answer. And you know, a little secret, you know when uh, the Holy Spirit starts speaking through me when I'm given that, because I babble. I, I will just begin to speak, and, and, and I, all of a sudden, after probably 20 minutes, the person might be falling asleep, but I, might, I, I start to realize, oh, mm. <sighs> take a deep breath. And then I realize, and I'm like, okay, I know that was the Lord. That was not me. There's no way. And that's, uh, there's times that are like, what do you even say? You know, there's situations in our life, what, what can I even say? And Lord, help me. Help me to say the right thing. Lord, help me not to say the wrong thing. The tube of toothpaste. My wife always gave that example in children's church, and it's so true. Anybody ever try to get toothpaste back into a tube? What a mess it makes, right? <laughs> it makes a mess coming out, and it makes a mess when we try to make it better ourselves, too. Instead of just doing what God tells us to do. But that's, he overcomes our weaknesses. He gives us strength to, to overcome the things. Because why? Because that's God's supernatural empowering us with his power. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to provide us with supernatural power, to, to be witnesses for Christ when we would never be able to do it be on our own because of our own weaknesses. I heard a preacher once say, you know someone's in the Holy Spirit when they're, they're acting in a manner or saying things in a good sense that they would never be able to do. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, the guy that denied Christ, began to speak and preach to them and actually said, you people who killed him. And he spoke with such authority, the Bible says, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Fourthly and lastly, God's presence comes to give strength for the journey. And you know, it, if you put all this together, it's, it really is appropriate to us today. Acts 1-4, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you had heard from me. And what was the promise? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The promise was that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, 
And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. What was he saying to them? That you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit to saturate you with the the Holy Spirit, to empower you to be witnesses. He said, wait there and don't go doing, don't leave there and go do things on your own until you've received the power. If your gas tank is on E and somebody says, wait there till I get there with the gas can, If you start it up and there's enough to start it and start going down the road, are you going to make it to your destination? Not likely. Why would you do that? Why would we, the Lord said, wait for the Holy Spirit. Now that doesn't give us an excuse. I'm waiting for the Lord before I do that. He told me to do this, but I'm waiting for, you know, the Holy Spirit to come upon me or whatever. He should be, if he already spoke to you and told you that, he's already... He's already setting things up. He's already putting them in motion. One of the former superintendents of the uh, Assemblies of God, the General Council, he, had, he said this, he wrote this, the purpose of baptism in the Holy Spirit is to overwhelm you with the presence of God that you will no longer dwell on your weak, own weaknesses and inadequacies, but instead be filled with the assurances and boldness. How many preachers have stuttered and, and they don't stutter when they preach or sing. How many people have speech impediments? You know, one of the things uh, with the apostles that they spoke with authority and they were not learned people, except Paul. Paul was trained, Paul, you know, but he spoke with power and authority. And then the, the, the other people, when they're like, oh, wow, look, listen to what they're saying. It's amazing. And that's how we can be. And, and, you know, God even amazes me sometimes. I'm like, wow, that's truly, even in this series I've been doing on Sunday, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. When the anointing's on me playing the piano, it's amazing. I tell you all the time, my wife says, yeah, I don't play like that at home. And the anointing hits, and now it won't bother her as much because I listen with, I have headphones on when I play more. I'm better, though. I'm getting better, though. And, and, but when the anointing hits, sometimes it's just so amazing. And, and you just play, I just play from my heart because I just want to have glorify the Lord and have fun. I want it to be right. Don't get me wrong. I want it to sound good because if it sounds way off and it's not good, nobody's going to be able to sing. And it'll disrupt the, it'll disrupt the presence of God. But but just to, to and, and I use that as an example, but maybe God has given you a gift in some other way. I say it again, you know, he gave us strength. It gives us strength for the journey. We have to have that. We have to have the Holy Spirit moving in our lives, speaking to us on a regular basis. Um, again, what Moses said in Exodus 33, if your presence does not go with us. I do not want to bring us up from here. Don't even think about taking us out of where we are and somewhere else if you're not coming, Lord. If your presence isn't coming. You know, I shared, that, um, I shared this at, uh, at my mother-in-law's funeral that in a, in a funeral message, I asked the Lord to give me something meaningful from him that will speak to the family, speak to the loved ones and the friends and the people that are there. Because you know what? I don't, I may know some people, I may know where they're at, but I don't know where. Most of the time, you know, I have no idea. And so I said, I rely on the Holy Spirit. And I rely on him to give me something meaningful. And, you know, for those of you that were there, you know that I gave, I shared the story that um, I had two weeks and the Lord waited till the last three days because my wife had this message on her phone for two or three days before she shared it with me. And that was what the Lord shared with me. And he gave that to me to, to go from there. 
And it was just a tribute that somebody, that Sarah, her granddaughter, had sent Heidi. And she never meant it to be read. She never meant it to be. And the Lord spoke to me and said, there you go. And I'm like, Lord, you could have gave it to me a couple more days, uh, days ago, whatever. But it, it's meaningful. And why is that? Because the journey is not getting any easier, and I don't need to tell you that. This is an encouragement, you know, and it's not, and, and it could be, oh, pastor, yeah, you preach this. Oh. And this is, a, this is, I'll say this is a, a, a very simplistic message tonight. It's an encouragement. You know, we're doing some deep stuff on Sundays and um, some real good meat. We're slicing up some steak on Sundays because that's what God's doing for us. But for tonight, I really want you to be encouraged, to be hungry with an expectation to know that God will overcome our weaknesses through his Holy Spirit, that he will get us through, and he will give, give us the power to get through the journey that we're on. And, and you know, I thought, I tell you this, I, I share this all the time, when my dad used to give the interpretations, and he would say, um, trials, tribulation, or not, you know, not the tribulation, but you're going to going through trials. And we all thought, this was pre-COVID, we all thought, yeah, this is tough times we're going through. And then it hit, and we're like, and then it now. And back when he used to do it, I used to say, Lord, already, enough is enough with the troubled times. Every time he'd give an interpretation, you know, in the flesh, they'd want to put him in the back and downstairs. No interpretation of that stuff anymore. We don't need to hear that anymore. And we had no idea. I, I think back in that all the time. In fact, uh, Pastor Joe's not here tonight, but we talked about it all the time. And I'm like, little did we know what we would be facing. Lockdowns and churches closed and this and that and and, and everything that, all the, the propaganda that they did. Preparing for God's presence. I don't even know if that's the right title, but if, I mean if it really truly explains, but you know me in titles sometimes. Expectation. Open expectation, hungry for the presence of God through the Holy Spirit in our lives without a pre-formulation. Without a pre-formulation. Be obedient to the word of God and the voice of God. Warning, warning, warning. Don't let the systems and the customs of the world distract us from our expectation. Don't let things in, in the world and, and what's happening in the world distract us from our expectation. Because when you come into church, something always happens Sunday mornings. And if it's Thursday night, Thursdays. Unity, get together. Get your hearts together and be hungry for the Lord in a common focus, meeting together in the, the Lord's presence and prayer. Commune with the Lord. Spend time with him. Don't let opposition and adversity discourage us from seeking the power of his presence. That's when God works his best in our uncertainty and adversity. He is certain, and he's our very present help in our time of need. Let's hunger and thirst for his presence like never before and watch how he will fill us to be used as witnesses for him. His power, the old hymn says, will make us who we ought to be to be overcoming our weaknesses and empowering us for the journey ahead. It's blessed assurance that we have our, at our disposal the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to empower us for our journey. Luke eleven thirteen. if then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Be encouraged tonight, saints. Be hungry with an expectation. And I know that we are, but I'm asking you, just encouraging you, take it up a notch and watch what God will do in our life. You'll be that person in the middle of a storm. It'll be whirling around you. And you'll have that peace that passes all understanding. It's not easy. But through Christ, through his Holy Spirit, we can do all things. And everybody said, amen. Shall, Lord, thank you tonight. 
for your word. I thank you for your encouraging word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your presence here tonight. Lord, I pray that, Lord, that we would come with an expectation. The world and all the things that happen in our life, Lord, distract us. The trials, the tribulations, the physical ailments, the struggles, Lord, from day to day. This world, Lord, takes out uh, our energy and, and deposits garbage in us. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would help us in our unbelief. You would strengthen us. And your Holy Spirit would work powerfully in our lives. Lord, there is no one that can do it like you. There is no one, Lord, that can give us that peace that passes all understanding. There is no one that can empower us in a manner and way that is specifically fit for us, Lord, like you. So, Lord, I pray that you would have your way in our lives tonight, that you would strengthen, encourage this body, those that are listening, those that are watching. Lord, that we would be encouraged, we would be empowered through the Holy Spirit. Let us be hungry for you. Let us be, Lord, expectant that you will do as you said you would do. You are who you are. You are who you say you are. You, you will do what you've promised to do, and you have the power to do as you have promised to do. And Lord, let us have great expectation and an expectation in that you will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could think or ask. That our mind cannot even comprehend the things that you have in store for those that love you. And Lord, I pray your blessing on this people tonight. Bless them, keep them. May your countenance shine down upon them. Lord, I pray that we would continue to commune with your Holy Spirit. Give them your peace, I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you.